Welcome to Foundation Baptist Church's Sunday morning service. This is the last Sunday of June, June 28th. It's hard to believe that time has flown so fast. So welcome to our services this morning. Thank you for those of you who joined us in our Sunday school. A good discussion on uh, what the Bible says regarding the foundation of the church and from to whom was the church, uh, uh, the church's foundation of, uh, laid on to. So uh, I hope that was really uh, helpful for all of you who were who had joined us. Uh, this morning uh, we have uh, a message for you once again. I just again would like to thank the Lord and those of you who have been continually praying for my complete recovery. I definitely feel a lot better and we're still on the road to recovery. But nonetheless, I uh, just had a visit to our doctor for our first checkup since our discharge from the hospital. And so far, the tests and the uh, you know the doctor's uh, comments basically were mostly favorable. So uh, we're still going slow, however, just to make sure that you know my body kind of adjusts to the medications and all of that. But thank the Lord and thank you for those of you who've been praying and uh, helping us out in the midst of all this uh, trial. So. Uh, this morning, uh, I'll be preaching on a text that uh, that as uh, we have been preaching on, and we've kind of been cut from that uh, message, uh, from that series, because of uh, what happened. So we're actually going to preach from 2 Timothy. And I'm going to read to you 2 Timothy chapter 4. And then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. 2 Timothy chapter 4 is our text this morning. And I'll be reading from verse 5 all the way down to the last verse. Okay? 2 Timothy and uh, chapter 4 until I finally find it. I know it's here somewhere. Thessalonians, Timothy. All right. So this four-chapter epistle uh, filled with instruction practical exhortation for godly living of course it was given to a person who has already been saved you don't give instructions to unsaved people to live right because they're not right with god yet so anyway second timothy chapter 4 is our text this morning let me read to you verses 5 down to the last verse verse 22 paul moved by the spirit of god writes but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions through the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also, that love his appearing. Do thy, do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia, and only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And thy chickens, have I sent to Ephesus. The cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring, bring with thee and the books, but especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom, I'm in verse 15, be thou where also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. <clears throat> 
At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray, God, that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever amen salute Prisa and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus Erastus abode at Corinth but Trophimus have I left at Miletus sick do thy diligence to come before winter Eubulus greeted thee and uh, Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brethren and the Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your faithfulness and mercies renewed. Thank you for renewed spiritual and physical strength that only you can provide. Thank you for Calvary as always. Thank you for the sufficiency of your grace and its unlimitable supply as you provided according to your riches and glory and we have a lot to thank you for we thank you for everything we thank you lord for the opportunity the privilege to serve you and we pray that you will be pleased in using us as your instrument as we seek to expound the text of your word to people who are viewing and listening to this so that they may hear the thus saith the lord coming out from 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 our message and that they will not hear simply the voice of this preacher but the still small voice of thy spirit speaking to them to each one of us with the pages of the inspired word lord we thank you for uh, you, you are continually in control you never um, surrender your your sovereignty to anyone you are god and remain to be god we thank you in the midst of all the turmoil, the chaos that is happening in our day, both in the local and the global scene, that you are still in control. And therefore, for those of us who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the assurance from your word that we are on the winning side. And uh, while the truth of the word seems to be trampled upon by men and ungodly people to this day, we thank you, Lord. We look forward to that day when you shall finally establish your kingdom on this earth and that the kingdoms of men will all fall until we see your uh, forever kingdom being established on earth. And, uh, <clears throat> and ultimately, <clears throat> the, world, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of thee. And what a joy that must be. What a blessed hope that every Christian has in the midst of things getting darker the world getting bleaker that uh, even before the establishing of your kingdom and uh, that eventually your imminent return the rapture will ultimately take place and therefore for the meantime we continue to pray for our leaders for our policy makers our government leaders our phone liners and uh, all those who are out there helping to somehow put things in order, give us a society that is uh, civil and, uh, and the like. We pray, first of all, from the president all the way to the smallest, from the counselor, policeman, we pray for their salvation. We pray that they will see their need for the gospel, that somebody would care enough to plant the seed of the gospel to each and every one of them, perhaps be pleased in using us to do that, <clears throat> so that they too might be saved. For thou art not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But we also pray that in spite of their standing before you, that you will, uh, <clears throat> we thank you that your word tells us that even their hearts are in your hands, and like the rivers of water, you turneth it whithersoever thou wilt. And therefore, we continue to pray for all our rulers, uh, that uh, not only that they would be saved, but that we may live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, <clears throat> and that we may use the liberties that we enjoy at the moment as a window, as windows of opportunity to continue to preach the gospel while there is time 
to redeem the time, knowing that the days are evil to work, uh, lest uh, the night might come when no man may work. Lord, help us as believers to see the urgency of the task of preaching the gospel to the lost, of planting local churches, of carrying out the Great Commission, exactly what you've entrusted to us, so that when you come, we will find we will be found faithful in the task that you've entrusted to us. And Father, as we look to your word for instruction once again, we look to you and the Holy Spirit for illumination. Open our eyes that we may behold wondrous truths out of thy law, and we shall thank you for it. Lord, speak to our hearts afresh. Strengthen us. We know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And therefore, speak to us afresh. Rekindle our hearts in love for you because you first loved us. And we shall thank you for it. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So beautiful day. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for uh, joining us in this service. And uh, bear with me as I continue to preach while sitting down. Part of my adjustment until I get back to the full swing of things. So uh, I hope you don't mind my preaching while sitting down. As a matter of fact, as I mentioned last week, uh, Jesus, when before he preached uh, the uh, Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew chapter 5 tells us that he sat down and usually when a rabbi sits down at me before a crowd that simply means that he's ready to, to uh, give an oracle from God something really important to his audience and perhaps maybe we can take it that way as I continue to preach while sitting uh, in this chair but I trust that you will be blessed as we look to his word for instruction now you will recall that we are looking where we've been going through Second Timothy, the entire book. So those of you who missed our previous messages, I think this is our eighth so message, our eighth message from all through from the book of Second Timothy. Four chapters, so we average about two messages each chapter. And uh, I trust that if you have not uh, read or have heard our series, that perhaps you'll be free to go back and read, listen through it so that you get the message of the entire book as we expound on these verses uh, and unleash its meaning verse by verse. Because we as fundamentalists believe in the verbal plenary inspiration of the Word of God. Meaning to say that while these were written by men, some 40 writers of scripture from the Old to the New Testament, written by men, fallible men, yes, they were, yet they were moved by the Holy Spirit, and therefore the Holy Spirit so influencing, superintending the writers of scripture to the extent that the very words that they wrote were the very words that the Holy Spirit wanted written down. So that during that time that they were recording scripture, that they were preserved from error because the Bible was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And if it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, it's breathed out by God. It's very, not only the Word of God, it is the very breath of God. And that is why it, there, is, there is benefit, rich benefit in going to the Bible and studying it verse by verse. And even if you go through that, you will never be able to exhaust this inexhaustible book. So we're looking at the last chapter of 2 Timothy, and by way of review, that let us recall that as Paul is the human author, as he was moved by the Holy Spirit, he's addressing this epistle to his son in the faith, Timothy. He was a man, he was a, during his younger years, Timothy was exposed to the gospel. He, like everybody else, is born a sinner. Since Adam's fall, all men are born in trespasses and sins. And therefore, Timothy is no exception to it. And uh, therefore, he needed to be saved. And thankfully for Timothy, he had a godly uh, heritage. His grandmother was a Christian. His mother was a Christian. And therefore, Timothy was exposed to the gospel, to the word of God at a very tender age. That did not save him, but at least exposed him to the truth of the word and the truth of the gospel. Uh, what a blessing Timothy had. And not many of us have that rich Christian heritage like Timothy, until eventually Paul Weintel points out in chapter 1 that he found that faith in him. In other words, there was a point in time that Timothy had to make his step of faith, trusting Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. 
So apparently Paul had that mentioned that because there was something, there must, there must have been something in Timothy that he saw. I mean, he could not see Timothy's faith. Nobody, none of us can see each other's faith. What we can see is the evidence of faith. And that is a transformed life. Good works, as James puts it. You know, faith without works is dead. Therefore, James is not talking about works as a means of salvation. He's talking about works as the evidence of salvation. And apparently, Paul saw, saw something in Timothy that, that convinced him with beyond a reasonable doubt that Timothy was a genuine, authentic believer. And because he was saved, therefore his, his, his childhood indoctrination, his conversion experience, and eventually his involvement in Christian service has been instrumental for the advancing of the cause of the gospel, especially during the pioneering stages of the Christian church. So this is last Paul's last inspired epistle. And he was writing it from prison. It's one of his prison epistles. And apparently Paul was released from his first detention after the burning of Rome in July AD 64. Nero, the emperor, in order to stop criticism of himself, blamed the Christians for Rome's burning. As a result, Christianity was made an illegal religion. Aren't you thankful that at least we live in places that Christianity is not illegal? It must have been tough for them to go through a mission field, live in a mission field where Christians and the preaching of the gospel had to be done somehow under the radar. But listen, Paul and the apostles openly preached the gospel at a price they were, they were willing to pay, uh, to pay for. Uh, it meant martyrdom for some. So Christianity was made an illegal religion. Sometime thereafter, Paul was apprehended and therefore was facing a certain death. He was scheduled for execution. It was not clear as to when, but his crime was viewed by the authorities in that day as uh, as uh, punishable by death. And God forbid it happens in our country or in other fields. But uh, so here he writes Second Timothy to his younger son in the faith. Uh, Timothy, because Paul was concerned about the next generation as he was about to pass out from the scene. So by way of review, notice in chapter 1 in verses 7 and 8, what was Paul's message to Timothy? He's talking, he's talking to a believer. He's talking to a pastor already. Here was Timothy who served as an intern in the church of Ephesus. And now he tells Timothy what he ought to do now that he was a believer and now an under shepherd of the flock and these instructions are helpful for all succeeding generations of believers and churches apparently to this very day and even in future generations should the lord tarry his coming so chapter one seven and eight what is the main theme of chapter one paul was saying timothy do not be ashamed to be identified with me his prisoner so he says, be bold for the truth. Do not be ashamed of the testimony of Christ and of the gospel. A challenge to every one of us as well today. Okay? Like he said, thankfully we don't live in a, in a mission field. Most of us don't live in a mission field uh, that uh, where Christianity is a forbidden religion or is considered illegal. So the situations that we face, no matter how difficult uh, we face, especially during these lockdowns and uh, quarantines, is not even close to the circumstances that the first century believers were facing or did face. Yet, the instructions that Paul gave was so practical and so appropriate, and these are God-breathed instructions for us as well today. Chapter 1, Be Bold for the Truth. Remember, the truth is exclusive. God is its author. It is objective. Therefore, it's not subjective. What was true in Paul's day is true in the 21st century. It's true in this country, in the Philippines. It's true in any part of the world, in Saudi Arabia or in further west. So it is objective. God's truth is not only exclusive and objective. It is rational. 
That is why God tells us to love Him with all our heart, soul, and mind and strength. Therefore, it's not irrational. Christianity is not a blind leap in the dark. It is true. It is authoritative and therefore binding upon all men. It is without hypocrisy. It is incompatible with all other religious systems. So, that's every reason to be bold for the truth. It is the truth. And if it is the truth, therefore we should boldly proclaim it. Not just proclaim it, but boldly proclaim it. Chapter 2. What was Paul's key instruction to Timothy? Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Chapter 2, verse 1. In other words, because of hostilities and opposition for the preaching of the gospel, be bold for the truth. And that does not mean and that does not uh, disregard the fact that we are frail and fallible. We, are, we have our own weaknesses. But where do we get that strength to overcome the opposition? Paul said in chapter 2 verse 1, be strong. That's in the imperative. And it's in the passive mood, so be strengthened. You cannot be strong in yourself. You have to be strengthened. Be strong where? In the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That's the source of our strength. And that is true of Paul as it was true of Timothy. That's true of the younger generation and is equally true for the older generation. Sometimes older people, you know, because they're old or older, I should say, is they feel that their ways are so fixed and that it has to be always the way. And therefore, because they're older, they feel they have some excuse in waning in their faith. On the other hand, younger people, because they're young, they feel that they're kind of invincible. And therefore, there's the tendency to rely on the arm of flesh. And Paul had to remind every Christian, as he was reminding Timothy, that we are to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So, God's truth has to be bold, boldly proclaimed. Chapter 2, verse 2, Paul gives the divine strategy for reaching our generation, and that is the next. What did Paul say there? He says, The things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same you, Timothy, commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. That's a divine strategy for passing on the truth. Chapter 1, be bold for the truth. Chapter 2, pass on the truth. That's a, that is a quality, that is a something that is so lacking in today's culture. In today's pagan world, the truth. I mean, the truth is being drawn by multiple voices that are contradicting the truth. And you know how it is. As the Communist Manifesto says, a lie often repeated is bound to be believed as true. So as believers, we ought to objectively see things from the light and the lens of the truth of the Word of God. So be bold for the truth. Pass on the truth. Then chapter 3, Paul cautions Timothy what may happen and what will definitely happen rather in the end times. In the last days, perilous times shall come. And no doubt, it doesn't take a scholar or this is not rocket science to, take, to see that we are definitely in those days, those perilous days, as Paul lists a, a, a list of sins, a catalog of sins that would be characteristic of the end times. But the first and the number one characteristic of the end times is that men shall be what? Lovers of their own selves. People will be narcissistic. They will not see things from another, another man's perspective, but more so from God's perspective. They will always be insisting on looking at things from their own selfish, limited perspective. See? So much so that as you go through the, the uh, catalog of sins that Paul mentions, uh, in verse 5 he says that apostasy, the departure from the truth, will be so strong that it will infect and affect the very testimony of the professed Christian church. That's why it says in verse 5, there will be a form of godliness, but people will deny the power thereof. It's going to be an outward form of godliness, but they deny the power of the gospel, 
or the substance of the truth of the Word of God. And what did Paul say? If there are churches that have departed from the faith, those last words there in verse 5, from such turn away. That's God's call, the Word of God's call for all believers. In churches that are departing from the truth, we should uh, withstand the truth. And to, for us to be able to withstand the truth, first of all, was in spite preaching the Word of God, for instance, a, a church or denomination has been taken over by apostasy, what are we to do? Of course, we need to raise our voices, preach the truth. But the moment we begin to see that the truth is falling on deaf ears, Paul tells Titus, you know, a man after the first and second admonition, a heretic, that is, after the first and second admonition, to reject. So after warnings of the Word of God falling on deaf ears, there is no point in staying a church that has turned apostate. From such turn away, Paul says. So we are to withstand the truth. That's the theme of chapter 3. How do you withstand the truth? By turning away from, from apostasy and by abiding in the truth of the Word of God. Chapter 3, verses 15, 16, 17. That is why there, Paul reminds Timothy, Timothy, from a child you've known the Holy Scriptures, it's able to make you wise unto salvation through faith in Christ. So the key, the solution to a world that has departed from the faith, to a culture that is embracing lies instead of the truth of the Word of God, is that the church, believers, should be further anchored in the truth. So that believers can serve as what God intended us to be, salt and light in the earth. That's the only way we can transform society. Now, God didn't call us to save this world. We are called to preach the gospel to save individuals out of this present evil world. This world is doomed for judgment. But nonetheless, we are to proclaim, we are to be bold for the truth, pass the truth to the next generation, withstand the departure from the truth, in chapter 4, a chapter we are now going through, is Paul's key command there is therefore because the Bible is, is uh, because of its origin, it is inspired of God, because of its power, it's able to make us wise unto salvation through faith in Christ. Because of its sufficiency, verse 17, it is able to make you wise unto salvation through faith that is in Christ Jesus. 17 talks about chapter 3 that the man of God may be perfect, meaning mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's all that a man needs for a godly life and service, the Word of God. Therefore, chapter 4, verse 1, preach the truth. That's the charge in chapter 4. Preach the truth. And as we close in, the, in our study, in the latter verses of chapter 4, what is Paul telling Timothy? A command for all believers is to finish the job. Okay? It is to live, live to completion the truth of the Word of God. Is that what he said in verse 5? Watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and make full proof of thy ministry. That word make full proof means to bring it to completion. Okay? So from chapter 4, the nature of the charge, it says, we are, Paul calls to his witnesses, the Father and the Son, in the light of the Lord's imminent return. All of us must give an account to God, and therefore, by his appearing in his kingdom, that's an incentive for faithfulness. What's the content of the charge? Preach the word. Preach is in the aorist tense, emphasizing. Punctilier action, the urgency of the task. It's in the imperative, therefore it's a command. So, aorist imperative. Preach, that's the urgency of the task. Preach the word in the light of the perilous days ahead. Or in the light of the perilous days in which we live. What else need people to hear? But the truth. The truth that comes from God himself. The word of God. Preach the word. Okay. So we are to proclaim as a herald the message given by the Lord himself, to announce it to the world without adulteration and addition or subtraction. And the reason is mentioned in verses 3 and 4. The time will come, it says, 
when they will not endure sound doctrine. Are we not living in those days? People will not endure sound teaching. Instead, they will, after their own lusts, heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. Sadly. And when you turn away your ears from the truth, you're bound to believe something else. If it's not the truth, these are myths, fables, as it says there, and they shall be turned unto fables. It's no longer truth. See, this is what the world needs to hear, the gospel. The world needs to hear a biblically coherent worldview, but it starts with them hearing the gospel and believing it. So that by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, not only can they be saved, but by following him, they begin to see what Jesus himself taught and proclaimed as they go through the whole counsel of God. So that's how important it is. And that's the urgency that God has given us and placed on our shoulders as believers in this 21st century. Men will actively turn away their ears from hearing the truth. And when God's truth is rejected, the human mind invents a substitute. That's always the case. It turns to fables and myths. And those who turn away their ears from the truth leave themselves vulnerable to be turned aside by satanic influence. Do you know where, who, who was the author of false doctrine? 1 Timothy 4.1 okay, The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter days men uh, uh, so turn away from the faith. There will be a falling away. And they will give heed instead where? To the seducing spirits and doctrines of demons or devils. Doctrines of devils. That's the genesis of source. Meaning the doctrines are coming from devils. These are doctrines authored by demons. That's how serious the issue is. And this is how urgent the task is for us. So, in verse 5, he talks about the completion of the charge. Be sober. Be vigilant. Say, watch thou in all things. Be sober in all things. That's word watch. Be sober. That means to abstain from wine. It means to be sober-headed. To stay on the alert. To be watchful. To endure hardships. Okay. Timothy is urged to suffer with him. He must stand now. He must, Tim, Timothy must stand alone for Paul would soon be gone. Now let's face it. It's going to be tougher to live the Christian life as we approach the end times. We, cannot, we will not expect you know, global revivals. We will not expect, expect uh, mass conversions. But we can win them one by one and we should be doing so faithfully preaching the gospel and then it says do the work of an evangelist amid Paul Timothy's pastoral duties Timothy was never to forget the unsaved and that's true for all of us while as pastor I am concerned about feeding my flock I should never neglect those who are outside the household of faith they need to be hearing the gospel so uh, <clears throat> we should be concerned in announcing the gospel to them and then it says in verse 5, uh, make full proof of thy ministry. That means carry out to completion your ministry. No back jobs. Okay? Make sure that what, God, what I've commissioned you to do, finish it. Bring it to completion. Evangelizing, teaching, pastoring must all be conscientiously performed. And there is no room for half-heartedness in the work of the ministry. So when do you say that you've done your, your assignment? You see, God has called every one of us believers to serve Him, to accomplish a mission, and also to preach His Word. And, once, and of course, once that mission is accomplished, then if we've done it well, we've, we've been faithful in that task, then we can expect the Lord to say you know, when we face Him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But while we are here on earth, continually uh, plugging on, preaching the word of God, facing obstacles to, and opposition, then there will be hardships. So let us not be surprised when these come. And this is why 
these exhortations, very practical as they are, are so relevant and fitting to our situation even today. And now, after Paul charging Timothy, make sure you make full proof, bring into completion your ministry. So, wherever you are, I'm preaching to you as well as I'm preaching to myself, in whatever station we are in our Christian life, we better make sure to set on course. Don't be sidetracked, neither to the left or to the right, but make sure that you are on course in fishing, finishing your God-given task. Because why, what was Paul's reason? Well, not only did God call us for that, but Paul himself was an example. Notice the pattern for the charge. The pattern for the charge in verses 6 through 8 was the Apostle Paul himself. Notice he says in verse 6, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. And henceforth that is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. What a blessing for Paul to be so confident <clears throat> of this reward because he knew he was right on task, on, on his God-given task. <clears throat> the Lord will give me on that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. A number of things I like for us to see in these uh, verses 6 through 8. First of all, notice the example of Paul. He said, I am ready to be offered. In other words, Paul regarded his ministry as an offering to God. What about us? Do we recognize ministry as an offering to God? Or hopefully that would be in stark contrast of clearly for Timothy and for Paul, Paul's ministry was in a stark contrast to the ministry of false teachers. False teachers conducted ministry offering false hopes. For what reason? Not for ministry, but for money, for selfish gain. That's what people are for. Some, pe some false, te false teachers are there for. And that is why the saying, has, the saying has been coined that religion is a profitable business. And they're sad to say sometimes that it's true, especially for false teachers, people who offer false hopes, saying that you have to earn your way to heaven by your human merit and good works, and then you give your money in order to earn merit in going to heaven. Wrong! Salvation is holy by grace through faith and the all-sufficient sacrifice of Christ. Have you trusted in Christ as your Savior? Now, of course, genuine ministry needs money. And therefore, we as Christians should make sure that our, our investments for eternity are placed on ministries that really preach the Word of God. Because we will be accountable to God as to how where we place our money. We might be supporting a ministry that is preaching a false gospel or offering false hopes. Be wary. For Timothy and for Paul, he said, I am ready to be offered. His ministry was an offering to God. Uh, his approaching death, therefore, he saw it was to complete that sacrifice. He said, I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Okay. So he, this word suggests the taking down of a tent. And here, this is a reference to his ultimate demise or death. Okay. And he says, I have fought the good fight. You see, Christianity is not a bed of roses. It is not a, a walk in the park. Christianity is a fight. And it is a good fight. It is a fight of faith. And Paul says, I have fought the good fight. Notice how Paul, with a joyful note, uh, <clears throat> that he had spent his labors in the good fight in this contest called the Christian faith. And that's what Christianity is. I mean, Paul did not sugarcoat Christianity and say, you know what, you want you to see Christ as Savior, you will be living in a bed of roses. Wrong. Because you have... The world that loves the darkness rather than light. You have your sinful nature 
the enemy within and Satan himself manipulating this world system to fit us into its mold. So it's going to be a, a battle, a fight. So you don't say, I didn't sign up for this. If you're a Christian for a quite some time, you know that it is already a spiritual battle. And in case you didn't know, you needed the reminders, here it is. Paul is reminding us of that. He wanted to end as well as he had begun. And what a tragedy uh, when it happens that some Christians get disqualified from the ministry. <clears throat> Paul said in Acts 20:24, 20, he wanted to finish his course and finish it with joy. And that's my prayer for myself. That's my prayer for my family. That's my prayer for each and every one of you. That each and every one of us who have trusted Christ our Savior will stay on course and finish our course. And not just finish it, but finish it with joy as Acts 20:24, 20, Paul stated in that verse. So how are you doing? There will be obstacles. There will be opposition. There will be tough adversities. And sometimes martyrdom for some. But for Paul, it will be an offering offered to God, a, a, uh, a fight, and he said it was a good fight, and it was a fight of faith. And that's why he wanted to finish, as I would like my, to me to finish my course with joy. So hang on, Christian. Don't get carried away, carried away by, by the pressures of ministry or the opposition or people who want to thwart the truth. See, stay on course because uh, just like Paul, you can finish your course and finish it with joy. Don't allow the temptations of the world to disqualify you from ministries. Keep short accounts with God. I mean, none of us are still perfect, so keep short accounts with God. Make sure that you draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. Resist the devil and He will flee from you. James puts it that way. So he says, I finished my course. I have kept the faith. That word kept is a military term. It means guarded. He guarded the faith. He preserved intact the faith. He made sure in the passing on of the truth of the Word of God, it was complete and intact no delusion no di no diminishing of the message and that's exactly what should be doing we should be doing we should be aggressively proclaiming and ac accurately preaching the truth of the word of god the gospel needs to be defended against the attacks of false teachers and even of some brethren who compromise the truth these are realities in ministry Today, as it was in Paul's day, you will remember, aside from false teachers who were out to malign the ministry of the Apostle Paul and malign his character, there were in Galatians, Paul called them pseudo adelphoi false brethren. People who posed themselves Christians and are within Christian circles, and they were pseudo, false, fakes. And it's not surprising it will happen today. Remember to the Philippians, Paul said, some preach Christ out of envy. Wrong motivation. Some preach Christ out of strife. Still wrong motivation. And of course, Paul did not condone that. But at least for Paul, that they're accountable to God. And he said, but for the important thing is Christ is preached. I rejoice. Paul did not rejoice that they were preaching in wrong motives. But Paul was rejoicing that Christ was being preached. At least that's, that's the, the good thing that you can only get from those who preach for wrong motives. So that's the example of Paul. He was ready to be offered. And notice his prospect. He said, I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. One of the crowns mentioned in the Bible that will be given at the judgment seat of Christ to faithful Christians. This crown more specifically, the crown of righteousness or the victor's crown is a reward for pursuing practical righteousness that pleases God, particularly because Paul anticipated the Lord's any moment return. So uh, salvation, remember, is a free gift. 
It's not that it's free. I mean, it's been paid for by Jesus Christ. It's free on our part. We cannot pay for it. Christ had to pay for it with his blood. If you are a sinner, just like everybody else, and you're not yet saved, we urge you to come to trust in Christ. Receive him by faith. Strip yourself of all self-righteousness. Trust in the perfect righteousness of Christ and in his precious blood as the sole acceptable atonement for your sins. And the Bible says he will give you, God will give you everlasting life. Salvation has been paid for, has been paid for by Christ. In the sense, it is free. It's a free gift. Received by God, received through faith in Christ. However, rewards are going to be given at the judgment seat for faithful believers. So God rewards faithfulness. And this particular crown is given not only to Paul by the judge, the righteous judge, but un, not to me only, but unto all them that love His appearing. What about you, Christian? Are you excited, enthusiastic, looking forward to the Lord's any moment return? Now, all of us might say yes. And if that is the case, then it should have a radical impact in your life as it should have been mine. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, Every man that hath this hope in him, purifieth himself even as he is pure. See? So a person who has the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ is coming in his heart will live a godly life, a pure life, and therefore will be seen to it that he is doing the will of God, his God-given mission, proclaiming the gospel in the light of the Lord's any moment return. Are you? Are we? You see, the second coming of Christ is always an incentive to holy living. It was an encouragement for Timothy, and it sure is for all of us believers even today. Listen, this world is not our home. So don't put your stakes and your hopes in this world because this world is going to be for judgment. Regardless of who occupies the Malacanang House or the White House or whatever, government okay this world is going to be bound by judgment is bound for judgment and finally we're looking for the day when christ himself will establish his rule and reign when he finally comes for that so as we close second timothy paul gives some concluding instructions in the remaining verses timothy was instructed to come to paul quickly notice in verses 9 to 13 all the way to verse 21 he says, uh, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Remember, Paul was about, was just awaiting execution any time. And of course, he wanted to see Timothy uh, perhaps for the last time. So come quickly. And then he says, and partly because, of course, he still was going through some trials. <clears throat> so there were some people who deserted him. He had already mentioned Hymenaeus. And Philetus, now he mentions another guy in verse 10. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. See? So even at this time when Paul needed the encouragement the most, one of the men, one of Paul's members of his team, you study the name, you make a, make a word study of Demas. <clears throat> Demos was mentioned in the other epistles, Philemon, Colossians, etc. And while not much is mentioned of him, this time, in his last inspired epistle, Paul elaborates who Demos was. Apparently, he was part of his team in proclaiming the gospel until, towards the end, Demos hath forsaken me. Why? Because he loved this present world and therefore departed uh, unto Thessalonica. See, there are people who will desert the faith, but take heart, don't be disheartened. Set your heart on course in your God-given mission. So Demas, Paul was alone. Demas had abandoned him. And then Christians has gone to Galatia, Titus to, Titus to Dalmatia, and he says, only Luke is with me, verse 11. And then he says, take Mark along. 
and bring him with thee. Notice what he says of Mark, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Do you know who Mark is? This is John Mark. John Mark the quitter, but he was the one who wrote the Gospel of Mark. So he was instrumental in laying down also the, you know, the pioneering stages of the Christian church. He wrote one of the inspired Gospels. So that's interesting. But yet in Acts chapter 13, we find John Mark after the, after the split or the division that took place between Paul and Barnabas. <clears throat> Uh, eventually there was a split that happened uh, so that Paul and Silas went together Barnabas went with John Mark see why well the reason was John Mark had deserted them in the mission field uh, that wasn't after the split but it was as a result uh, of John Mark a split took place see John Mark was part of them and then so for some reason not mentioned in the book of Acts John Mark quit the ministry was it because of lack of food? Was it because of the quality of the food? Was it because of, I mean, we're left to speculation. But John Mark quit ministry for a while. But thankfully, he bounced back. Bounced back so much so that he got right with God and eventually made himself usable once again. So not only did he write the Gospel of Mark, but here in his Paul's last part in Spartan Epistle, Paul says he is profitable for me or to me for the ministry who are the other Paul companions of the Apostle Paul Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus and then he mentions verse 13 some other things that Paul wanted to see Timothy bring along he said so Timothy's place at Ephesus was to be supplied by Tychicus one of Paul's associated associates rather whom he gave praise to. Now in verse uh, 13, Timothy was asked, was being asked to bring what? Paul's cloak, the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, but especially the parchments. Okay. Apparently this were, these parchments are probably some of those original writings of the Apostle Paul some of the writings of the other apostles perhaps these were among some of the autographs or what about the books well apparently Paul never lost interest in his studies and it should be true of every preacher of the word okay? I mean studying the word of God and studying the books needs is needed in order to provide quality preaching and if you as a Christian, you may not even be in pastoral ministry or preaching ministry, but all of us have been called to preach the gospel. So if you want to be equipped in order to preach the word of God with clarity and substantiated with scripture and history and illustration and all that, certainly studying is important. It will add quality to your preaching. And furthermore, verses 14 and 15. He mentioned another one of his deserters. Verse 14, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. So this is another Alexander uh, compared to the other Alexanders in the New Testament. And Paul knew that God would render him his due reward. So he even cautions in verse 15, of whom, speaking of Alexander the coppersmith, be thou ware also, be wary about him, for he hath greatly withstood our words, apostolic words, apostolic teaching. So, see how important the apostolic truth is? And it should be welcomed by every born-again child of God because it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Timothy informed was in form of Paul's first defense, verses 16 down to 18. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me, and I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> Paul was telling Timothy of his, uh, again, how he was forsaken by some, some human aides who forsook Paul. Note Paul's unshaken faith 
in the preserving power of the Lord himself. He said in verse 17, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. <clears throat> now it seemed to me, as I go through these passages, that, uh, you know, desertions, abandonment in ministry was seemed to be common to the, example, to the experience of the Apostle Paul. There are people who will not stay true. And even if that be the case, we ought to stay true because like Paul, he relied on the preserving power of the Lord himself. So don't be, don't be, don't feel alone when you find a Judas in your ministry. Don't, don't wallow in self-pity because other godly men have gone through the same. Of course, I know sometimes it's easier said than done. But just like Paul, our strength will come from the Lord himself. So Paul gives his greetings to some of his friends. He says in verse uh, 19, Salute Prisa and Aquila. This is godly couple, Christian couple. Uh, they were matured in the faith. They were instrumental even instructing and uh, and equipping, remember, Apollos, uh, who was very eloquent, but they thought that they, he needed some more equipping. Priscilla and Aquila was a godly couple among the believers of the first century. And then the household of Onesiphorus, Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletus sick. Isn't that interesting? Uh, Erastus more likely is the Erastus of Acts 19.22. But when I said, isn't that interesting? He mentions Trophimus, whom Paul left at Miletus sick. Well, this is one apparently of Paul's traveling companions. And Paul apparently did not practice divine healing on all, not even his close associates. You see? Apparently, Paul did not believe in a you know, healing crusade ministry where everybody should come to my, this meeting in order to get healed. No. The gift of healing went with the miracles and the signs and wonders that was, it, that was confirming the ministry of the, of, the gift, of, of the ministry of the apostles. And even if they had the gift of signs and wonders, Paul did not see that it was necessary to heal everybody, even among his companions. Because sometimes it is God's will for us to be ill. Because it is in most of those times, sometimes we realize that strength is made perfect in weakness. So we move on in the conclusion of his epistle. He says, Do thy diligence to come before winter. Eubulus greeted thee, Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren. These are the brethren who brought real encouragement to the Apostle Paul. In contrast, of course, to those who have deserted him. And he closes his wonderful epistle, his last inspired epistle, by saying, The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. What a blessed epistle that is. And I challenge you, go through the message of the, of the entire book, because it is really a message that is needed today. The truth of the Word of God. See that every Christian, every believer should not be ashamed of. You remember, be bold for the truth. If we don't speak the truth, then who will? If believers don't. I mean, false teachers and uh, people who have a warped ideology, warped worldview are the ones out there voicing out their error. And sometimes, some of them, in fact, most of them, deliberately do it to deceive. Is not what Paul said? They are deceived themselves, and they are deceivers, and they themselves are being deceived. So be bold for the truth. Second, we need to pass on the truth. Third, we have to withstand the departure from the truth, the apostasy of which we are living in. And therefore, we are to preach the truth until we finish the job.
By the grace of God, it is my prayer for myself, my family, our church people, and those of you, the rest of you who are listening to this message and watching it, I'm praying that every one of us will finish our course. Not be disqualified, but stay on course and finish it, and finish it with joy. Is that your prayer? That is mine for myself, and I'd like to pray for you as well. So why don't you join with me in prayer as we close our study of 2 Timothy. Our Father, thank you for the wonderful message of 2 Timothy. Thank you for the life of the Apostle Paul and of Timothy. And thank you for the wealth of instruction that you gave by your Spirit through the Apostle Paul to Timothy. So that the church is definitely richer with these epistles that you have not only given us, but preserved for us succeeding generations. And Lord, more than just appreciating your message, help us to submit to its authority. Because these are not only an apostle's instructions of a mentor to uh, Timothy, but these are your words binding upon each and every one of us today. Lord, help us to be resolved in our hearts to keep short accounts with Thee, to confess any sin that may be uh, a, a hindrance to our fellowship with You, to claim the cleansing part of the blood of Christ as ground for cleansing, and to re rededicate or yield our lives to Thee, to make our bodies and our lives and our ministries a sacrifice a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto thee, which is our reasonable service. And by your grace, help us to be able, like Paul, to finish our course, to make full proof of our ministries, and to finish it with joy. And this is our prayer. We shall thank you for it. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us, and may God richly bless you.